It's with projects like this that I'm very happy that I got into geology all those years ago. This is an absolutely cool project that I want to bring to your attention. I'm James Sykes, CEO of Metal Energy, and here I am introducing the Source Rock Lithium Brine Project. This is Ontario's first lithium brine project, and we, Metal Energy, control a dominant land position with untested regional targets. Very cool project. Bear with me, and let's get through this. The obligatory forward-looking and cautionary statements, I'll definitely be making a lot of those, so read at your own time. Very quickly, the market, everybody knows lithium nowadays. This is, EVs are really driving lithium demand, and the value of lithium is just, it's skyrocketed. Is it going to come down? Probably not. As so long as EVs are around, we've got a very good market for lithium. And when you look at the, the forecasted demand for lithium, it's huge. It is exponential. There is a lot of lithium required to, to go into EVs that are forecasted down the road. How are we going to get them? There's hard rock, and then there's really brines. We like the idea of brines because there is a simplicity to it. So this is the Source Rock Project. We're up in northwestern Ontario in the Thunder Bay area. And Thunder Bay has basically been a mining hub for more than 100 years and still counting today. There's a lot of mines up in there. There's a lot of good geology up in there. Excellent infrastructure too. Amazing infrastructure. Highways, railroad, international seaport, power lines, gas lines, labor force. Everything you need is up there. Perfect place. Not only that, the Ontario government, the federal government are fully supporting lithium exploration production. Recently, in the past 12 months, you've had uh, you've had financial support provided by the governments to to a, to three companies within the area, all for lithium production. Right place, right commodity, and we think Brian is the way to go. We staked. Uh, we were we didn't earn in with with an original project in the area. We loved what we were what we were told about it, so we just went. We staked a big a big area in 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 this Thunder Bay area. Total land package is about nine hundred thirteen kilometers squared. Very big land package measures about ten to twenty kilometers wide, and it's ninety five kilometers long. So this is no, this is not a small little thing. We basically captured the bulk of a jurisdiction. And the project really does cover the deepest parts of the Sibley Sedimentary Basin, where the sedimentary thicknesses can range anywhere between 500 meters to 1,000 meters. So again, not only is it large scale uh, from an aerial standpoint, but when you look at 3D, it's very deep. So there's a lot of potential going to depth as well. Kind of looks like a very crazy slide here. A lot of things going on, so we'll simplify, but this is a very simplistic, simplistic in quotation marks, model of a lithium brine uh, formation. And the three big things you got to take away from this are source, sink, reservoir. So what's the source? Well, number one, you've got the, the rocks around you, rich in lithium. If they're not rich in lithium, you're not going to have lithium brine, not, not high concentrations anyway. So the higher concentrations that are in the rocks around your sink in your reservoir already perfect great so a mountain belt with with lithium with lithium rich rocks perfect and then they erode and go down the go down the uh go down into the sink but you can also have hydrothermal solutions whether that's magmas or metamorphic fluids however they're derived that's also a source that can provide lithium though and then you've got your sink so your sink is just basically a, a bowl really that allows for sediments to be deposited. So creating that, that sedimentary basin. And then your reservoir is really just the fluids that come in. Uh, not the, Just because you've got a, a thick sequence of sediments doesn't mean that the entire thing is going to be, um, going to be enriched in lithium fluids. Uh, your reservoir, your lithium, your specific lithium reservoir could be controlled by certain lithologies. So it doesn't mean the entire thing, but uh, typically, look at the look at the elements that you're seeing there: sodium, potassium, and then lithium, rubidium, and boron. Very common in lithium brines. So let's look at our let's look at the source rock area. Okay, back in the Archean, so 2.7 billion years ago, even older than that, it was a mountain belt up in the Thunder Bay area. Very big mountain belt, and this is when the the Quetico subprovince formed. And we've got lithium bearing pegmatites, quite a number of them, in the Quetico subprovince. After the mountain belts form, they get eroded. Oh, we have the Black Sturgeon Fault too. We couldn't find any age dates on the Black Sturgeon Fault, but pretty sure that it formed during this mountain belt. So the Black Sturgeon Fault, very important in this area. And then everything gets eroded. There we go. So the old mountain belt's gone. 
you know, too long after that, you know, on geological time scale, 2.2 billion years ago. And by 1.8, we started eroding the, the Trans-Hudson origin. Origin basically means mountain belt. If anybody's not familiar with the Trans-Hudson, though, what famous basin is part of the Trans-Hudson origin billions of years ago? The Athabasca Basin, your high-grade uranium. But that's further to the west. That's out in Saskatchewan. Trans-Hudson really encapsulated Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. So as that starts, as that, as that starts eroding, those sediments start moving east. At least on the the, the easternmost side of the Trans Hudson, the sediments erode to the east. Now, what we're seeing in in Saskatchewan and Manitoba nowadays is that there are a number of companies coming out and saying there's a lot of lithium potential in some of their projects. So was the Trans Hudson really enriched in in lithium too? Excellent. Great. Because as we transport those sediments to the east to where, towards where our source rock project is, perfect. We've got more sedimentation. And somewhere between 1.6 and 1.1 billion years ago, the Sibley group sediments were deposited. And they're deposited in a Hofgraben. So that, that triangular shape there is called a Hofgraben. And it was really controlled by the Black Sturgeon Fault. So as the as the basement rocks, those the Quetico subprovince rocks are, are drawn down, the sediments from from the Trans Hudson, as well as local Quetico rocks, are, are broken down and they're all encapsulated into these sediments and, and create these sediments. So, you know, that's source. We've got source in Trans Hudson. We've got big source in the Quetico because of the lithium bearing pegmatites. We've got our sink now with the Sibley Group sediments and the reservoir, of course, because, because the water's filling in there. But we've also got another source, the Mid-Continent Rift System, which is famous in this area for, for nickel and, and other elements. Uh, up in the area, we do see a lot of mafic, mafic dikes, which, which were derived from the Mid-Continent Rift System, but we're also very close to Lactazil, very big PGE province. And... With, with the mid-continent rift system, what it did was really, it thinned out the crust. And any any ascending magma could have, uh, and, and the fluids associated with these, so there's any hydrothermal fluids associated with ascending magma, more than likely came up the, the Black Sturgeon Fault and any other faults that were associated with the, the, the formation of the Hofgraben for the, for the Sibley Group sediments. So we've got everything we need there. We've got source, we've got sink, we've got reservoir, but this is billions of years old there's no other basin like it that i know of you look in you look in the uh, the himalayas today they're pretty recent less than 100 million years you look at the great western sedimentary basin uh, i forget the age states on no but they're they're not more than 300 million years ago and and even over in down in south america in the lithium golden triangle the lithium triangle those are not old rocks they're so this is a unique place where you've had the potential for a lot of fluid rock interaction. Now let's look at the Quetico. Quetico is in the gray, right in the middle there. And you can kind of see that gap right there. That's where our project basically is. That gap is the Sibley Basin. It's a pull apart basin, that half graben, and it cuts right through the Quetico. But if you can't see it right away, check that out. Right beside our project is the Georgia Lake Pegmatites. These were discovered in the 1950s. The whole area encapsulates about 30 kilometers by 105 kilometers. What did I say our size was for the project? 10 to 20 kilometers by 95 kilometers. So our project alone could basically encapsulate the entire Georgia Lake Pegmatites very close to it. And one of the resources out there. So as of 2008, the Georgia Lake Pegmatites were the most well-known and largest, by far, by far the largest lithium province in all of Ontario. So 15 years ago, okay? Whether, I don't know if that's actually true nowadays, but our project is right beside what was Ontario's largest lithium project. And if those rocks were being broken down during during the whole geological event to create the, the Sibley Sedimentary Basin, that half graben, guess what? Those rocks are going to be incorporated into the sediments. And then as soon as you add water, lithium loves to be in water. Those are those rocks. Spodumene will break down very easily. It loves to weather. Not a very strong, not a very strong mineral. It would rather break down and release lithium than stay whole. So vast potential. And then even further down in the Quetico, you've got the Lac La Croix pegmatite group as well. So Quetico, enriched lithium source to begin with. 
taken a cross section through uh, an, an idealized cross section through our project. You've got the host, you've got the basement rocks there, which are all lithium basement rocks enriched. The potential brine reservoir, you can see the, the triangular shape there is the half graben, but also there is uh, potentially an impermeable cap in this area. So what that would do is it it holds everything together. It, it creates a closed loop circuit that the fluids don't escape unless faulting does cut through that impermeable cap. But for the vast majority, this would create a closed circuit, which would provide, <clears throat> provide a better chance for more lithium concentration. And as those fluids are migrating along the, the basement rock contact, so the unconformity really, but also along the faults, those fluids are going to leach out the lithium. They're going to break down any lithium bearing rocks and leach out the lithium. That lithium is going to go into the fluid state within, within the, the brine there. So our project source rock, we staked it over what we believe are these are the deepest parts of the Sibley Basin where we've got depths anywhere between 500 meters to 1,000 meters from surface down to where we're going to hit the basement rocks. Very thick, very thick lithological sequence with a lot of potential for not just maybe the whole thing's a reservoir, maybe they're isolated reservoirs. We don't know. We have to explore because no one's ever explored for this yet. But I want to keep reemphasizing this. It was it's we've got a deep ancient solar. You've had you've had salt layers forming in this basin in 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 the Sibley sediments. So we know that the the conditions were right even when these when the rocks are being deposited that you had salt being formed just like any other evaporitic sequence across the globe. We know that we had uh, lithium. We had fertile parental lithium source rocks with the Quetico subprovince. Those are key in pegmatites. Those are those are primary source rocks number one. We've seen a lot of faulting, rifting, and just all of that action, which promotes fluid rock interactions, and billions of years of it just increases the potential for concentrating lithium and brines. We also have salt and sylvite, so sodium and potassium respectively previously observed in drill holes in both sediments of the Sibley Basin, but also the basement rocks. And sodium and potassium can be can be classified as pathfinders. Now let's look at some of the, the exploration in the area, the previous exploration. Early 2000s, people were exploring for nickel, copper, cobalt, PGEs, and uranium. You know, you've got a basin there. What is the potential that it's anything like the Athabasca? Let's go explore for uranium. Makes sense. I can't I can't argue with that logic. But you've got, uh, so they flew EM surveys and they have drilled. If we look at some of the, the drill hole results, and this is what blows me away. Some of the things that I've, I've read and seen from, from the reports and just in, in talking with people about the project who have previously worked on it, mind-blowing. It's, it's some of the things I've never heard of in my life. Okay, halite and sylvite veins are formed in the Archean rocks at depths up to, up to 180 meters beneath the Sibley unconformity. So let's say we drill down 500 meters and you hit the unconformity. Well, you're still seeing halite and sylvite veins 180 meters beneath that. So, and even most of the Archean rocks are saturated with salt water. That salt water is just moving. So we're, we're seeing this, this brine potential that is infiltrating the basement rocks already. Pegmatites were intersected in most holes that reach the Archean rocks. We don't know if they've been assayed for lithium though. We, we have to find those reports and figure out what's going on there. We heard that the Sibley sediments were sampled with anywhere up to 60 meters that returned between 100 to 200 ppm lithium. That's in the sediment rocks. That's not the brine. I've never seen anything like that. You know, Athabasca doesn't even come close to anything like that for, for, for lithium. But the look at the Great Western Sedimentary Basin. You've got companies out there where they've got brine uh, and their, their concentrations are like 70, equivalent to 70 ppm. We've got sediments that are much shallower. We're not going down to two and a half kilometers. We've got sediments that have the potential for even being their own lithium, lithium enriched rocks. But we're more curious to see what the brine will do in the area. There's petrographic evidence that indicates sediments were previously cemented with halite, but now a lot of it has largely been dissolved. Where does it go? It's, it's in the fluids. Perfect. We want them in the fluids. My favorite visual observations of salt and crustaceans forming on the drill rods and the core to me that indicates a super saturated solution 
If you're not familiar with that term, if you've ever had honey in your house, you bought honey, you eat honey, you know that when you get down to the end of of using your honey, you're gonna you start seeing these crystals form. That's because honey is a super saturated solution. Same thing as making uh, making suckers or rock candy, where you add so much sugar into a water, you boil it all down, and eventually all that sugar comes together to form your your rock candy. Same thing that's happening here. You've just got so much salt. You've got yeah, just so much dissolved salt in the water that as it comes out, it is it forms almost immediately on the drill rods and cord. One of the stories I heard was that uh, in the, well, from one of the geos who, who drilled in this area, in the Sibley Basin, looking for uranium, early 2000s, the drill company bought a brand new drill, the first time they ever used it, on somewhere in the area. And within halfway through the project, which and it wasn't a large project, so we're assuming a couple of months, the rods were all rusty because of all the salt in the area. Absolutely crazy. Like this is this is just enriched in salt to begin with. So all of the all the previous exploration basically walked away saying, yeah, you know, it's not good for nickel co cobalt, it's not good for uranium. But nobody ever really looked at this area for lithium potential because it wasn't big. It, you know, lithium's really only come around the last 5 to 10 years. No one was really exploring for it previously. Now with the brine potential, that's yeah, metal energy. Metal energy comes into this. Very quickly looking at just some chemistry again, talking about super saturated solutions to understand why we like seeing sodium and potassium in the rocks because they are the pathfinders. When you have an evaporative, evaporative sequence, so you've got all of these elements in the water and the water starts evaporating, the first things that come out are going to be calcium and magnesium, typically as carbonates and sulfates. So your calcites, your gypsums, and hydrates. Okay, they will come out first. Then you would typically get your, your sodium and your potassium chlorides. So your halite sodium chloride, that's table salt. And then your potash salts. After that, though, you typically get your lithium, beryllium, boron, rubidium, strontium, cesium, barium, all of these other wonderful elements that start to that 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 start to form as well but not until you know the, the main ones are gone. Like I said, lithium loves to be in water. It would rather, it'll stay in the water form until it's last possible scenario. So in that situation, that's, that's how you create a lithium super saturated solution is by removing everything else, water going, and you're just, you're really concentrating lithium. So if we, if we stay on this whole uh, Pathfinder kick, let's go down to Chile and Argentina looking at some of the solars down there, which are world famous for, for high lithium concentrations. I've got lithium in the red box there, and you can see potassium right below it. Now, the potassium concentration in these areas is typically 10 times lithium concentration. So if you see high concentrations of potassium elsewhere, there is a good chance that you could have high concentrations of lithium as well. So as we're seeing silbite panes in, in the basement rocks, and as we're seeing salts form on the, on the drill rods, do we have high potential for lithium at source rock? And I say we do. It makes sense. Now that we're looking at the Solars down in South America, let's look at Chile. Chile is the second largest lithium producer in the world. And it all comes from, from these type of brines. The Salar de Atacama, it's a big, it's a big area, 90 kilometers by 50, but the main production comes from the, the central salt area. And the, the main production itself measures about 25 kilometers by 10 kilometers, 250 kilometers squared. You can see it right in there. That's 30% of the world lithium production comes from that area. Our source rock project covers 913 kilometers squared. So if there's lithium in the brines at source rock, this does represent a very unique opportunity for metal energy dominating this whole regional geological area. Like I said, we've staked the vast majority of the Sibley Basin and the deepest parts of it for sure. But we, we love these ideas because again, you, this is where you get your, your high concentrations of lithium. Same geological model that is used at, at the South American Solars as what I showed earlier. You've got source rocks. So your, your rocks that are in the area as they are, they get eroded, they come down the rivers, 
Uh, you've also got the potential for magma, magmatic fluids coming up, faults, and then you know going into the sink. And there's your triangular shape, your off grabbing as well. And your reservoir, of course, your waters. Same situation as what we're seeing. Again, the only difference is we're looking at billions of years, not millions of years. More potential for fluid walk rock interactions in a closed system. Comparing the two projects visually, you can see the scales at the bottom right. Same scale. Slar to Atacama on the left, source rock on the right. Slar to Atacama is much larger, but the central salt area where all the production comes from is basically the same size as source rock. If you took that top, the northern part of source rock and folded it on itself, you'd have pretty well the same size of a project as the main producing area of of the Salar to Atacama. But where all the production is literally coming from, you can stick that area right into source rock and have a similar type of scenario. Very cool. DLE, direct lithium extraction, very important for brine projects. The concept's not new. It's been around for decades. And there's a lot of similarities with ISR, ISL type of operations in the uranium industry, where you're pumping down fluids and You've got injection wells and recovery wells, and that you're recovering uranium from from sediments from sedimentary rocks. Sorry, deep buried sedimentary rocks, recovering uranium. So it's it, it's basically a fluid form. Really, no different from oil and gas operations as well. And to a certain extent, DLE is very similar to rare earth separation. Now, rare earths, you're you're separating seventeen different elements in in a fluid state so you're doing the same thing here you've really got to you know you can separate out the sodium potassium rubidium cesium lithium uh, but any any dle project or i guess any dle uh technology has to be tailored to the project individually what works on one project is probably not going to work on the other it's going to have to be uh, it's going to have to be finangled and just um but prepared for that project. But the whole thing with DLE is that you've got much smaller footprints than any other mine operations, much smaller, because again, it's, it's almost like an oil and gas operation. You've got potential for lower operating costs, and you've, but more importantly, especially for where the batteries are concerned, you've got a very good potential for high purity recovery. You're looking at four nines, four nines. What does that mean? 99.99% .99 lithium. That's what you need for batteries. 99% lithium doesn't cut it. And when you're talking about batteries, you cannot have impurities because it degrades your, your battery very quickly. So you need to have high purity recovery. DLE offers that. And you can see some of the lithium recovery technologies right underneath there. Adsorption, solvent extraction, electrolysis, base systems, membrane base separations. And on the right-hand side, again, this uh, whole list of different technologies their mechanisms and who's developing so dle is not new this is something that is really going to push lithium brine production all across the globe and hopefully source rock is going to be one of those really summarizing everything i've just talked about can't emphasize some of this stuff enough did we have an arid climate yes we did when the sibley rocks were being were being uh, laid down and deposited you had solars forming we, we, there are salt beds out there. There's salt in the rocks. So it was it was already arid enough to create this environment, to create these conditions. You have a closed basin? Yes, we do. You know, we've we've got the um we've got the half graben. It's rifted. You've got cap rocks on top. Everything's a closed system. Is it tectonically driven? Of course it is. Black surge and fault. I showed you that half grab. And you've, then you've also got the mid-continent rift system potentially providing more geothermal fluids. And again, that goes with the associated igneous or geothermal activity, that igneous plume, that mid-continent rift plume. But originally your metamorphism with the Quetico, the initial lithium source rocks in the area. So there's multiple events of things happening. Suitable lithium source rocks, just mentioning it. Quetico subprovince lithium pegmatite fields. We've also got the Trans Hudson rocks that eroded and came down too. Adequate aquifers, of course, highly porous, permeable stratigraphy. Uh, the porosity, really, you know, with with halite being removed from a lot of the rocks, that creates the perfect perfect place for fluids to move. 
There's also groundwater under pressure in some of these areas. And then did you have sufficient time to concentrate a brine? Yes, more than a billion years. That's huge. That is, that's, that's wonderful. More fluid rock interactions, the better for a brine type of project. Where are we at right now? Brand new project for us. We acquired a large land package, 913 square kilometers. Immediately after acquiring all that land, we sent out emails to the indigenous communities within the area, introducing ourselves. So consultation is already started right out of the gates. And we will be continuing that as, as much as possible and as quickly as possible. We've already got a permit in hand as well. The original project that was that was in the area and that we that we staked around, they the the vendors had put in a permit application for the area. That permit has come in. So we've got permits to drill on the source rock project already. But we're gonna continue the, the consultation with the indigenous communities first, make sure everyone is happy, and then hopefully get on the way to drilling later on this year. In between all of that, we're going to be doing some data compilation because there's a lot of data out there. You know, we, we, we have to put it all together. We want to see the historic geophysics that was done. Really want to get uh, sink our teeth into a lot of the, the drilling that was done in the area. Because the more we can learn about what's going on, obviously, the better. Well, we're, we're basically ready to get going. So that's, ba that's source rock. You know, very exciting. I... I I'd love to be able to drill it right now, but we'll, we'll, we'll play this, right? We'll play it patiently. What haven't we discussed? Well, and what will we discuss down the road? As I mentioned, we'll be doing a lot more uh, historic assessment uh, research. So looking at a lot of the, the historic work that was done, and we'll provide a nice geological understanding of everything done in the area and see how it maps out with, with what we've already come across. I haven't really talked about the basement rock lithium potential. You know, I've mentioned the fertile pegmatites of the Quetico, but I haven't really talked about any potential of those rocks beneath the Sibley Basin, beneath those sediments. We have mentioned that they've you know, drill holes hit hit pegmatites in the in the Archean rocks, but we haven't seen we we haven't done enough homework to see if they were sampled for lithium or any types of concentrations or even the mineralogy, if people reported them. So yes, their homework, homework has to be done. I mentioned fluids under pressure. That's a possibility for methane and methane has a market. It's also potential for helium. Again, with pegmatites in the area, could you have helium? The thing is with helium though, you need uranium. So is there potential for helium? We'll find out. We'll keep that in mind. I've also mentioned a lot about salt, though. Like, let's call it sodium. And sodium is very important now because you look at some of the largest EV battery, battery manufacturers in the world, CATL, BYD, they've already started developing sodium batteries, replacing lithium for EVs because there's more of it. So if we've got a lot of sodium at Source Rock, and another classic story that I heard from the area, from people back in the 50s, when they're drilling the area into the Sibley Basin, they recognized that the, the fluids were all full of salt. So they filled up a bucket of, of water, and then they boiled off all the water and ended up with half a bucket of salt. That's a, that's a lot of sodium in, this, in, this, in these fluids. So that's another potential. And again, DLA for sodium, very possible probably even easier than than lithium so sodium is a potential element out of source rock as well but we're you know we're chasing it all we're going to see what it's all there i hope you enjoyed it this was another project another exciting project brought to you by the or group of companies i think we're a unique group in that we've had a lot of a lot of successful companies the baseload with our our accio deposit and and hopefully more discoveries coming this summer. American Eagle Gold kicking butt out in BC with a wonderful project at NAC. QC Copper and Gold with the Opamiska mine uh, out, out in Shibugamu, Quebec. And even Ore Finders recently with their discovery out in the Thunder Bay area as well. So Ore Group of Companies, great group of great group of companies, great people behind it. 
you are, if you're getting bored of of Netflix or other any other streaming services, go take a gander at our YouTube channel, the Or Group YouTube channel. You'll see you'll find a lot of highly educational videos, and you'll learn something. I guarantee it. Thank you very much. If you enjoy this, please contact us. Info at metalenergy.ca. You can contact me directly, jsykes at orgroup.ca. Go to our website, check us out. We'll be updating it very shortly with uh, with information about Source Rock. Follow us on Twitter. Follow us on LinkedIn. Go to the YouTube channel. Tell your friends. Get people's eyes on this. This is a project that you you want your friends to see. You want your investor buddies to see this project because if there is a project with huge lithium potential coming on stream, this could be it. Very quick to get going on a lithium brine project. You just need the right DLE. But you got to have the source, and we think we've got the source at Source Rock. Thank you very much for your attention. Take care.